Why? Governor Daniels. If he tried to fix a welfare system that many would argue was never broken. While we appreciate Daniels' fiscal responsibility and his faithfulness not to raise taxes, I believe that there are issues on which he needs to hear our concern. Those familiar with the new private welfare system will tell you that it's idealized and extremely frustrating for all involved. It's happened so many times, not only in our government, but everywhere. A situation is wrongly perceived by someone in higher authority, and naive changes are carried out, throwing the system into chaos. From experience, a school janitor could tell the principal that his new procedure for setting up a gym before a basketball game could have been done far more efficiently, or a meticulous accountant could point out to the boss that his new pet project is actually going to drain the company's resources with very little payback. In the same way, those who are involved in our, or are familiar with the welfare system, probably could have told Daniels that running the program like a self-help hotline or processing cases like an auto assembly line was only going to lead to frustration. But as is always often the case, the man with the authority gets his way, even of those who are involved in regardless of the consequences. In the old system, Welfare caseworkers were able to work with a select group of clients. That way, they could become familiar with those clients' financial situations and needs. But the way the system is run now, clients have to pick up the phone and re-explain their situation to a new agent every time they check in. Also, processing cases is a lot more complicated now, with each case passing through several different hands before it can be approved by a state employee. This involvement of multiple parties it reduces processing efficiency, and it increases the likelihood of error. If just one of the many parties involved in this chain doesn't fully understand the nature of a given case, then his or her work will likely be inaccurate and then have to be redone. Or we might ask our Congress, why is our border security in such bad shape that a group of civilian Minutemen have been forced to take up the cause themselves? And in the meantime, why do our own congressmen dream of every conceivable way to sabotage their efforts? Many members of Congress have shown their support for the matricular consular card, despite urgent opposition by Homeland Security and the FBI. Despite its implications, this highly unreliable Mexican-made ID has been shown overwhelming support in the Democratic caucus. But to combat Democrats' claims that they are anti-Hispanic, some Republican representatives have joined the movement as well. American recognition of this Mexican-made ID would make it fairly easy for illegal immigrants, particularly criminal fugitives, to assume false identities and live under the radar of detection within our borders. Our Congress has also shown exasperating kindness to Mexico and has given them sizable monetary gifts despite the fact that Mexico impeded the American justice system by harboring fugitives of substantial crimes on U.S. soil. Meanwhile, back at the Oval Office, President Obama has gone into the auto business, purging GM's board of directors, replacing seats with his own appointments, booting out the old CEO and apparently dubbing himself the new unofficial monarch of government motors. Now, Obama dictates what GM may and may not produce, although he insists it is only to get the economy back on track, just as our government did with Amtrak, which has lost $23 billion since 1990. That was a tease, $23 billion since 1990. And despite our government's claim that it was only stepping in for a year or two to stabilize the railroads, Amtrak is still in business 38 years later. Despite having the leadership of many great administrations, the Amtrak company has one of the lowest inner-city rail usages in the world. And it is a first-hand example of what happens when the government sticks its nose in the private sector. The government also, the government also owns about 8% of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and AIG. And we all know what, how, how well those businesses ended up. And enough bailouts already. Our government needs to learn that some risk is necessary in business. <laughs> in 
and many companies out there don't deserve to survive after the way they've handled their assets. There's no use. There's no use in pumping ludicrous amounts of money into a dysfunctional business that will almost certainly waste the money anyway. We need to make our voice on these issues loud and clear for our representatives to hear, because those who do not learn from history are certainly bound to repeat it. Might these problems be indicators that after all these years, our own system of checks and balances is beginning to erode and break down. We attack our government officials for invading our privacy in the name of counterterrorism, or for poisoning our free market with their interference. We call out our judges for legislating straight from the bench. But does the core root of the problems lie in a deficiency of our own government, of, of how our own government is set up? After all this time, is it possible that our own system of checks and balances is due for a rigorous upgrade? This too, we as the people must decide. And if you've lost hope for yourself, then please, take interest for my sake. For your children, or for your grandchildren, the decisions being made today are going to affect my generation more than anyone. I mean, do I look like the kind of kid that can pay off a $10 trillion debt? I wouldn't bet on it. But there's another concern I want to bring to your attention this morning. The health care plan currently in the hands of our Congress poses a considerable